evening, everyone. Welcome to the April 23rd regular meeting of the Revere School Committee. Please rise to salute the flag. Roll call the members. Mr. Ferranti? Here. Ms. Gravelisi? Here. Ms. Rizzo? Here. Mr. Sonella? Here. Ms. Fai? Here. Yeah. Mr. Visconti? Here. Mayor Rick? Here. Uh, tonight we will start our meeting with recognition of spelling bee finalists and winners and myopoly winners. Dr. Kelly? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, it's awesome to see so many people here tonight. Uh, I know it's because you want to, uh, we are so proud of your kids, as, as, proud, of, as proud as you are, uh, of all these kids and their great accomplishments. And we're going to start tonight with uh, the Spelling Bee winners, where we're honoring our first, second, and third place winners at each of our elementary and middle schools. And we're also going to recognize those students who went on to the regionals. And then after that, we have our uh, first, second, and actually a tie for third place uh, Myopoly winners. And I'll let them explain a little bit of what that is, but it's one of the most intense and deep learning experiences I think that any student can participate in. And um, we'll talk more about that when the time comes. So I'll go and begin with the... So we will start with the um, spelling bee finishers at the Beachmont School. In third place, Elizabeth Barry. In second place, Fiona Haziri. And the first place in the Beachmont Spelling Bee is Rana Murabi. <laughs> For Garfield Elementary School, our third place winner is Juan Flores Ramos. Our second place winner is Aya Bari. And the first place winner at the Garfield School and also an attendee at the regional spelling bee is David Kossel Roth. At the Hill School, our third place spelling bee winner was Jocelyn Jimenez Villar. The second place winner at the Hill School is uh, Jenna Yelmalkis. And the first place winner for the Hill School, and also a student who attended the regional competition, Sarah Granados. I should have mentioned at the beginning that um, the Scripps National Spelling Bee competition changed the rules this year. 
And in order to be invited to the regional competition, you not only had to win your school spelling bee, you also had to submit a writing sample and be approved through your writing sample to actually move on to regionals. So it's a huge accomplishment for these kids who were able to do that. And um, we were very proud that... We were very proud that we had six kids actually go to regionals, uh, which is a very high percentage considering only 100 kids across, a couple hundred kids across the state were invited, six of them from Riviere. Um, so uh, the Lincoln School is next. And in third place, we have Hannah Arati. Second place for the Lincoln School is Emily Uribe Lopez. And first place at the Lincoln School is Leonardo Bea Rodriguez. At the, at the Paul Revere School, our third place spelling bee winner is Leona Lee. Our second place winner is John Bigali. And our first place winner is Lena Lee. At the Wayland School, our third place winner is Dela Berkson. The second place winner is Ivan Tejada Serrano. And the first place winner is Lena Gurati. the middle schools uh, with at Garfield Middle School the third place winner is Tenzin Tashi in second place Annabella Sandy Roach And the first place winner is Teo Hood. Yes. At the Rumney Marsh Academy, our third place winner was Walter Rodriguez. In second place, Madison Mercado. And the first place winner at the Rabbi Maj Academy is Hakeem Malki. Susan B. Anthony, our third place winner is Matthew McGowan. Our second place winner at the Susan B. Anthony is Elizabeth Messina. And the first place winner at the Susan B. Anthony is Gavin Rua.
All right, so that is the end of our uh, Spelling Bee Awards ceremony. And next we're going to um, talk about uh, Myopoly. And as I mentioned, we had two third place finalists for Myopoly. The first, and I'm going to ask each of these recipients to come up and tell us a little bit about your research project, uh, if you don't mind. The first is Jason Acosta Espinosa. Uh, also tied for third place, Kobe Everton. <laughs> Dave, I might have to rely on you. <laughs> uh, in second place, Michael Renchevich. <laughs> and our first place winner uh, is Ava Hawks. everyone. So my fellow finalists, my top, my top placers aren't here today. Uh, some of the committee members may know me <laughs> from, I, was, I tend to be here uh, for some pretty significant reasons. Um, but Myopoly, talking about Myopoly, it's basically a months long research project that AP language and composition students get to participate in. We get the unique opportunity to participate in this um, right off the bat. So during the summer of our sophomore year, um, we get to pick a topic that we are interested in. It, it's not assigned by any of our teachers. We pick the topic ourselves, and we research this topic ourselves. We, you know, we dive full in. We're, the goal is to become a specialist or an expert uh, in your respective field, um, and it's really intensive. It's, you know, in my case, it was conducting my own research, not just relying on the research of others, uh, and building an argument um, for, you know, to present later at the Myopoly competition, which is a visual presentation where all of the AP uh, language and composition students present their arguments and kind of go against each other. And um, basically, it's who is the most engaging, who presents the best argument, who has done the most research, who really knows their stuff. It's not just presenting the argument and making your case. It's going through three rounds of judging with all of your peers and answering questions, diving, you know, diving deep into your topic, seeing how much you know, seeing how you can defend your topic. Um, and really uh, getting down to it. Um, that's really important. That's a really important part of Myopoly. Um, should I talk about my topic? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my topic was a little bit out of the box. Uh, I'd heard from a lot of teachers that it hadn't been done before um, and was just kind of way out of left field. Uh, my project, my research inquiry was about the, um, the existence of online subcultures surrounding school shooters, particularly the Columbine shooters, which is something that I know a lot of parents worry about, something that a lot of us kids worry about at the same time because school shootings have become so, uh, just so, I, it, this is the wrong word to use, but popular in the United States, they've become so common. It's kind of, we've, we're not shocked by them anymore, which I found insane. And there's an online, there's a whole subculture online that exists surrounding the shooters themselves and it's just absolutely insane. Talking about it here, like, trying to sum it down like water it down really wouldn't do it justice. Um, but I feel like it's particularly relevant today because the 20th anniversary of Columbine was just on Saturday. And um, you know, my paper really tries to address, my actual research paper tries to address the concerns of parents um, you know, researching this, this community, researching how the effects of school shootings just beyond you know, the media sensation and beyond the actual deaths that have occurred, the long lasting effects way in the future. How does this affect culture as a whole? And, you know, who is it drawing in? Who are we putting at risk? Um, so that was basically my topic. That was what I was trying to address. Um, and, you know, I just poured my heart into it. I worked really hard on it and I won. And my finalists also won. <laughs> they won second, third, uh, second and third place. Their topics were, Second place winner, Michael Ronsvich, his topic was um, the occurrence of gang violence in Chicago and gang culture in Chicago. And the people who tied for third place, Kobe and Jason, uh, Kobe was talking about plastic straw bans and um, their possible like risks when it comes to the disabled community versus the environmental benefits. And um, my friend Jason, he was talking about uh, the occurrence, the rise in teenage suicide rates and how that relates to social media. So we're all doing really relevant and important topics that um, you know we could provide, even though we're students, even though we're really young, we could provide valuable insight into. And that's why I think 
myopoly is really important. Sure. So uh, just thank you again for all being here tonight. We're going to take a brief recess, but we're just so proud of all of these students and the great work they do. And we look forward to hearing about the myopoly projects that some of our Spelling Bee recipients of today will complete when they're high school students in the coming years. We are now back from our recess, and we will start with the superintendent's report. Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mayor Rigo. Um, we actually have several presentations from different schools tonight under the superintendent's report. Uh, and the first one is going to be from students at Revere High School who have a proposal they'd like to put forward regarding the wearing of hats uh, within the school building. Uh, after that, we have a presentation from students at the Rummy Marsh Academy uh, on a history fair project that they did, and I believe it's going to be an interactive presentation for us. And uh, after that, uh, principals, uh, Principal Paczynski from the Garfield School and um, Principal Holmes from the uh, Hill School are going to talk to us about changes to their schedules anticipated for next year. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to invite Sophia Garcia and Iyad Karaj up from the high school to talk to us about their proposal. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. Love that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. Uh, so, we just want to propose uh, kind of a counter to the, the hat policy that we currently have at RHS. So the policy against hats started in the 1990s in schools due to fear of gang affiliation. This has stayed within schools down to the modern day with our dress code uh, being no student should wear headgear of any sort in the school building except for religious purposes as directed by school personnel for safety purposes, for special events or activities, or where permission is given by the appropriate administrator. <coughs> Since Dr. Perella has been here, there have been questions regarding this policy as to its effectiveness and whether or not we need it at RHS. So Dr. Perella has taken it upon himself to ask 11 other high schools what they do in their school. Seven of them said they don't have enforcement policies or just simply don't enforce it within their schools, while four have strict enforcement. Many schools with our growing and modern society have expanded what headgear means and define it differently. Common headgear such as head wraps, headbands, hijabs, do-rags, baseball caps, beanies, and scarves are now being included as headgear that can be worn within schools. Um, the Revere timeline, uh, students, since uh, Dr. Pearl has came uh, into the school, Students have constantly asked him about the hat policy. Uh, this is a problem that's come up many times. Uh, and then it went on into the school improvement team, which is a team that meets once a month to discuss problems uh, and other <coughs> topics for the school. And then, um, and so, yeah, sorry, I can't remember. Uh, Students uh, brought the conversation to school improvement council. Teachers, uh, members, and parents made suggestions and con conversed with the staff. Uh, three formal uh, focus groups were all invited. Those who could not make it, the focus group were invited to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, one teacher felt that uh, the idea 
wasn't necessarily like it was a concern in terms of manners while uh, the remaining 49 teachers said that they would be in support of this idea uh, the a pilot proposal was developed and <coughs> shared with the school groups that we need uh, a, uh, we need your support school committee support. Since there is fear that hats will lead to negative impact on discipline, education, and the overall culture of schools, we have decided that we have we will launch a pilot at Rivera High School. So for the remainder of the school year, what we're asking is that we allow appropriate headgear to be used by students at Rivera High School. So no hoods and no hood gear with inappropriate words or pictures. The same rules for a t-shirt are to be applied to the hats and the headgear. So it's like a t-shirt but on my head. Uh, the school administration at the end of the year will review the data. We will have focus groups with students and teachers alike regarding what they have seen with school culture and if it has changed with the inclusion of hats if have there been negative impacts on discipline and learning and relationships between students and other students as well as students with administrators and teachers which is something at Rivera High School we're trying to improve exponentially if this pilot is successful and we find that there are no negative impacts we will submit a request for changes to the 2019-2020 student handbook to this committee Research shows that wearing hats doesn't necessarily affect uh, students' learning, uh, and uh, it hasn't at all, it hasn't been proven to do so. We want to see that if it's in the case in Revere. Uh, colleges and other training programs allow students to wear whatever they want. They could come in pajamas or slippers or, or anything that they deem comfortable and, and as a way to express themselves. Um, as you all know, that high school is not only a way to allow students you know, to educate themselves for years, but it's a way for us to discover ourselves. It's a way for us to express ourselves, find who we actually are. And having you know, a, a policy restricting uh, a formal piece uh, of headwear is just another one of those rules that you're not necessarily <coughs> gonna see in the real world. In the real world, you know, you could come in, uh, obviously an appropriate, uh, Appearance, but of course, uh, it's always up to you. Um, it restricts our sense of style. Uh, as I said before, discovery who we are and who we want to be, um, and student voice. We came together, you know, for many problems. This is one of them. The fact that we're able to face adversity and speak out, the, just like as we're doing now, uh, is only an example of why we're. We should make these changes. We are the future of the of America, the future generations, um, and the fact that we're able to speak now will only promote that same ideology in the future. Thank you. <laughs> so um, you two don't go away. I know that Dr. Perella wanted to talk a little bit uh, about this as well. And then after that, we'll have questions from the committee, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you to both of you guys for that uh, eloquent presentation. Um, so this is something, obviously, that has been brought up to us in many forms. Uh, the building leadership <coughs> team has discussed this uh, pretty often. It's, you know, it, we, we review school rules on a daily basis. We've had conversations in the building with students, uh, with, with administrative staff, like I said, with teachers. Uh, and it's something that we think makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think we need to rethink how some of the rules and routines that we adhere to in society as well as in schools. And when students brought this to my attention and then we compared it to how other districts view the HAP policy and we weighed, weighed it in the sense of, is it worth this fight for what educational reasons does this fight um, accomplish? What will, we, what will change educationally? And that's basically where I come in, where I view it as, is it going to impact education and learning? and we don't believe it will. Uh, we also don't see it as a safety situation. When, in hoods, for instance, is an example of something where I would argue differently because it can hide a, a person's face. Where if a hat's worn appropriately or if, if it's an appropriate hat, we don't see it as a safety concern. So um, this is something that we'd like to try. We would like to, for you to consider as a, a way for us to get some, do some research in, in the school and to really engage the students and the faculty in examining practice. 
and, and, and as such, I'm very proud of these students for what they've uh, accomplished in this discussion. And I'd love to uh, answer any questions. I'm sure they would as well if you have any. Any members have any questions? Uh, Mrs. Rizzo. Like all my colleagues, we are so impressed with um, not only you students, but all the students at the high school that have used um, Student Voice to their best advantage. Um, and you're to be commended to take one subject and do the work on it and bring it before us. Um, I, I have a question on what would be considered appropriate hats and who would decide what an appropriate hat our headgear would be so that would be uh, under the purview of the administrative staff it, like we would sort of sort of gauge all clothing and appropriate could be something that obviously isn't violent or uh, has any sexual um, elements to it or anything that would harm or, or uh, impact other students so similar to a t-shirt where we wouldn't allow certain things on that shirt we would gauge the hats obviously there are some hats that wouldn't be appropriate for school for, for instance <coughs> large sombreros, for instance, is an extreme example, but that's not something we would allow in, in a school because it's a hat, technically, but it's also, um, it would impact education. So uh, we, would, we would always view it through the lens of safety and in its impact on, on education and le learning and teaching. Any of you, you like to add something to that? I asked Dr. Perla this earlier, especially with the current issue of that young woman uh, wearing that MAGA t-shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with him that it is a political statement in the same way that I hope that we would allow a student to wear a Black Lives Matter um, hat or immigrants are welcome here hat that we allow and we, though I may not personally agree with the views of what MAGA stands for, that we allow that person to be able to express themselves and we include them in the diversity that we have here at Riviera High School. <coughs> now would, like, would these be considered appropriate? No, so hoods would, yep, it's a great question. Um, so we're not basically uh, saying anything on your head is fine. We're saying that uh, baseball hats and caps, and sometimes in the winter, students like to wear uh, winter hats too, uh, and, and because for a variety of reasons. So there are certain hats that we would allow. Hoods, are, we would view that as a concern safety-wise because it hides the identity of students as well as you could hide <coughs> earphones in your, in your ears and you could fall asleep if, with a hood on in class and you wouldn't be able to see it. So clearly that would impact education and, and safety. Any other members have questions? Uh, Ms. Gravelisi. Um, just one question. What type of data will you use and how will you analyze it at the end of this trial to see how it impacts student learning? So our plan is to engage the uh, faculty in conversations and discussions to see what kind of impact it has on their the teaching in, in the classroom, but also look at discipline data and see if there's any, uh, any change in trends regarding uh, school incidents or classroom incidents. We would talk to students about how they, so there's a, there's a combination of qualitative and, quanti and quantitative um, information we'd be seeking. It, it, it isn't a perfect science, there is no model for this, so, but our view is that we would look at the hard data that's a, uh, that we see through our data systems, but also really the soft data from, from teachers. If we have enough teachers that view this as a concern at the end of the year and they present that to me, that this is impacting education, it's impacting teaching, then that would, that would be very clear to us that this is a concern. And the same way with students, you know, we would seek, I don't expect them to be upset by this, but we would ask them how it has it impacted your learning, is, has there ha been any changes in the way you uh, operate in the classroom or, or interact with other students or teachers. Thank you. Any other members? Ms. Ty? Um, you know, this, the issue of hats, wearing hats is, when I was teaching here, you know, uh, it was an issue then too. And the, uh, the lines were drawn clearly. I think the lines are drawn much less clearly now. And uh, your presentation, which was um, excellent, uh, not only for the research that you had done, but for the manner in which you conducted yourselves while you did it. Um, I think um, I w it might be appropriate at this time for me to make a motion, Mr. Mayor, that we refer this for further discussion with the, to the Committee of the Whole. Well, I, I'm not, I, I didn't say policy specifically because I think 
all of us need to weigh in on this in the very beginning. So I'd like to refer it to the Committee of the Whole. And I think maybe we would like to have uh, further discussion with you um, on some of the issues involved around it. So I'll make that motion. Okay, motion on the floor, second. Uh, all in favor, all opposed? Aye. Okay, so the motion is gonna, uh, this motion will go to our Committee of the Whole. We will keep um, you all uh, engaged and make sure that the conversation that happens after this uh, inclu is in, you know, inclusive and uh, a robust conversation. Good. Thank you. And, and I'm sure the committee will get back to you in a timely fashion so that if it's possible to have the pilot, there's yes. enough time to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mrs. Rizzo, did you? Yes, and if we have further questions, can we for forward them to you, Dr. Perella? Of course. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Uh, so the next item on uh, the superintendent's report is a presentation by students from the Re Rumney Marsh Academy. And I'm gonna, before they come up, invite Dr. Gallucci up first to introduce them and also to tell us a little bit more about this project. Hello, everyone. Uh, I wanna thank the school committee uh, Mr. Mayor uh, and Superintendent and Central Office members for having us here tonight. I am here to introduce uh, a group of students that will be competing in June in Washington, D.C. at the National History Fair Finals. Um, I'm incredibly proud of this group of students. Um, Andre uh, Kadifsu, uh, Christy Lee, Emma Higgins, and Kathy Trin. Uh, these students have been working incredibly hard on this History Fair project. Um, they've presented at our Semester Showcase slash Culture Night. And um, this project's uh, very unique. Um, as, as we've seen History Fair evolve from the standard kind of uh, poster board presentation to then introducing electronic PowerPoints, now we're, uh, we've entered kind of a new realm where we have live performance. Uh, and this group placed second for the group live perform for the group performance at the Massachusetts History Fair Finals. Um, so, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to them. They are going to uh, conduct their performance and then take any questions you may have about their work or this project itself. Take it away. Oh, why don't you step up to the phone? Oh, okay. I don't know what you say. Hello, I'm Andre. I'm Emma. I'm Christy. And I'm Kathy. And we are here to perform our history fair performance. We have decided to do it on child labor and Mother Jones' effect on it. We were actually inspired by our math teacher, Ms. Danolo, um, as one day we were talking about how um, child labor laws affected us to this day. Mother Jones, who is the main protagonist and main figure of our project, was an advocate against child labor, and she was the main cause that child labor was abolished in the U.S., and she helped um, organize strikes and protests that eventually led to the end of child labor. Uh, child labor used to be very prevalent back then. Uh, children like under 14 and as young as the age of like nine would go to work in a, like factories and mills and get sick or get their hands cut off or just get severely injured and maybe die. But now since Mother Jones has fought for us, uh, we like children like us can go to school and we don't need, need to like go work anymore. <coughs> 
This year we've decided to do a group performance because for the last two years we've been doing boards and more of the writing and gluing and pasting. But in, we decided that a group performance would be more fun for us to do this year. And because we have such a huge um, thing like child labor to do, we decided it was better to show instead of tell. Hopefully you'll enjoy our presentation and learn something new. Um, please. Um, we'll take just a little bit to set up, but it won't be long. Thank you. The Industrial Revolution was a time of advancement for modern technology. However, it was a horrible period for children in America. As child labor was used and industries boomed, children were deprived of a healthy childhood and education. It was truly tragic. However, Mother Jones decided to protest against it, and the nation soon realized how inhumane it was to use children for labor. This article from the Federal Gazette has an advertisement in it. It's looking for children 12 and over to work in a local cotton mill. It is hoped that these citizens, having a knowledge of families, having children destitute of employment, will do an act of public benefit by directing them to the institution. But mother, I'm only nine. I can't go to work yet. But all I want to do is go to school for the first time. We'll just have to forge the papers then. We're barely scraping by as we are right now. But with this job opening, you can help your family earn a little bit more money and put a little bit more food on the table. Please, take the job for us. All right, mother, I'll go, even if it means letting go of school. at the mills. This past year, I've had to stay at home to take care of your father and younger brother who are still sick from black lung to, to, due to working in the coal mines. We've been making less and less money and we're all malnutritioned. You're the only one supporting us. 
this, but I'm always getting sick in the mills. The air is always so dirty, and I'm afraid, like, I'll get really sick. Okay. Uh, don't you know about Car Carmela Teoli, our neighbor, who used to live next door? Her, she got scalped in the mills when her hair got caught in the machines while she was working. She's been hospitalized for several months now, and the doctors say she might not even make it out. Uh, and even if you don't remember her, don't you know about the Triangle Shirt Waste Fire? When 146 women burnt to death in a factory when the owners locked the doors so they can leave their jobs? Mother, please, you must understand. It's a dangerous job, but it's a risk we have to take. It's our, it's our only option. I am heartbroken to see you getting hurt in the mills instead of going to school and learning for the first time. But there's nothing else we can do. It's life or death at this point. You're our only hope. escape my life at the mills and go to school for the first time. And, but if I stop working, then my family will all starve and die. Extra, extra, read all about it. Fearless woman leader cries out against child labor and proclaims herself the champion of the children of the textile mills. Someone's fighting against child labor? Of course somebody's fighting against child labor. It's absolutely cruel. We shouldn't let children work in such awful conditions at this age. They're going to get hurt. Who are you? I don't talk to strangers. Well, <laughs> I'm actually the person in the newspaper. I'm Mary Harris Jones, although most people call me Mother Jones, but you can meet me. What happened to your hand, little one? Oh, it got cut off when I was working in the cottage mills. My mother says we have to go to work, or else my family will all die. Of course you don't have to work. This is outrageous. When you show people what's happening to our precious children. I've got stocking kids like you. I'll arrange a little public Oh, Mother Jones, can I please come with you? I don't want to be stuck in that mill forever. Of course you can join my poor child. We've been through so much and at such a young age. I'm hosting the March of the Mill Children, and I'm rallying together many children and their ch parents to end this tragedy. Any child is welcome to join. We went from Philadelphia to New York to see President Theodore Roosevelt. I thought that the President might see these mill children and compare them with his own little ones. Everywhere we went, we had meetings, showing up with the children and showing the horrors of child labor. We want President Roosevelt to hear the wails of the children, who never had a chance to go to school, or work 11 and 12 hours a day in the textile mills of Pennsylvania. In Georgia, they just passed a bill to protect songbirds. What about the children from whom all song is gone? I beg the President that he free them from slavery and cruelty. The prosperity he boasts of is the prosperity of the rich, wrung from the poor and the helpless. We are told that every American boy has the chance to become President. But these little mill children, deformed, dwarfed in body and soul, with nothing but toil before them, have never heard that they have a chance, a chance of every American citizen to become president. The crazy old lady marched down Oyster Bay, demanding the president to listen to her and the children. Thankfully, the president wasn't foolish enough and rightfully ignored her. However, the march had somehow done its job. The nation thought that child labor was a crime, and they were furious at mill owners like myself. After their ridiculous little tour, they went back to Pennsylvania, which soon after passed a law firing thousands, firing thousands of children from the mills and prohibiting thousands of others from entering until they were 14 years old. It was suffering the loss of the children. They were basically animals of economic value. The movement, not caring about my financial loss, was celebrating the tribe, the tour. Mother Jones was instrumental in the abolishment of child labor by hosting the March of the Mill Children which helped raise awareness towards the issue and helped gain supporters against it. She also organized other strikes that helped free other children, like minor boys. She even continued our education because some of us never got to finish our schooling. We hoped that someday Mother Jones could come to our local schoolhouse to teach us all. But sadly, on November 30th, 1930, Mother Jones passed away, living for roughly 100 years. We mourned our mother's death, but we, are not, but we never stopped fighting in our mother's honor. Pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. These words were kept close to our hearts and we never forgot Mother Jones. Mm -hmm. Now I can finally rest in peace and all my little children aren't being abused in dangerous factories. With new laws put in place, I can't exploit children anymore. <coughs> it's truly a tragedy. <coughs> Jones. Us children who used to be like me don't have to go work in the mills anymore. This is truly a triumph for the nation and is a triumph that will last for all future generations. The children of America are finally free.
That was awesome, you guys, unbelievable. And you know, one of the areas that I struggled in when I was in school was history because I would always um, reacted more like to things that you guys just did that made it feel real and made me feel a part of it and made me understand it, um, as opposed to just reading about what happened years ago in a book. And so I think the way that you presented this knowledge, I mean, I certainly learned things. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about everybody else, but I didn't know all this much about Mother Jones. I'd heard of her, but I certainly didn't know about all the work that she did and all the advocates she did and all the kids that she saved. So you've taught me something tonight, and I'm sure that everybody who hears your presentation um, at the History Fair is going to learn something too. So thank you all very much. Any questions? Mrs. Rizzo. I'm just wondering where um, where you will be going next with the history fair? Um, at nationals. You going to nationals now? Yes. So you're going to DC? Yes. Oh. Um, we're going. Do you need a chaperone? <laughs> <laughs> I try. Any any other members? Miss Ty? Was it fun to do? Did it take a long time? And I noticed that. Really, you didn't stumble at all. Not one of you stumbled. You went right through and knew you. Was it really hard to learn that, or was it a love of uh, expressing what happened? Well, it did take a very long time. We started this project in September, and we first presented it in January. Um, it did take a while to learn the lines, too. I think we finished our script in December, and it took us each about a month to learn our lines. And we have revived revised and revised every time we perform because we want to make our project better. Oh, that's good. And does it change a little bit each time? Or? Yes, it does. Oh, it does. Yeah. Making it better. Well, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. And how did you get that Mother Jones outfit? <laughs> <laughs> some, somebody did some sewing. <laughs> well, we did start off with much different um, costumes, no. but then after our performance at States, we um, switched them up a bit to make them a bit better each time. Oh, good. Always improving. That's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tai. Uh, Mr. Sonella. Ladies, to um, have it right here in Massachusetts up in Lowell and Lawrence, the cotton mills and um, young ladies at the start coming from the farms to work the mills when it was um, profitable for everybody, but then as the market got flooded, wages dropped and all that. This summer, if you're looking for a little activity, you go up to Lowell, they have um, mills open, so you can see it its entirety, and they have some uh, historical aspect of it as um, they were given housing originally, it was food on the table, but just how it degraded itself as time progressed. So as a follow-up to what you've already experienced, it, it's really a well worthwhile trip. It's, it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanella. Uh, incredible work, ladies. Um, I have one question. Uh, what research did you do, or where did you research um, some of the information that you, you presented tonight? Uh, well, Mother Joan's speech was mostly from her autobiography, and we tweaked a little part, a few <coughs> parts of it. And a lot of her information came from like professors who had grandfathers who worked in the coal mines, or um, professors who knew about like the labor laws surrounding it. And it was like really helpful, and we incorporated every part of it into our performance. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic job. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly recognize behind every great project like this is a ton of family support. So thank you to all the families that supported these students. And also, um, I want to recognize and thank, there's a ton, obviously, of teacher support. So their um, civics teacher is Mr. West. Uh, he, he provided an incredible amount of guidance, encouragement, support along the way and uh, Mr. Nolo, their math teacher, who served as their inspiration. So thank you to all.
we'll take a uh, two minute recess. Two minute recess, and we are on the superintendent's report. Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, the next item on the superintendent's report is, as I mentioned earlier, presentations from Mrs. Lomas and from uh, Mr. Pachinski regarding changes to their schools. And we're going to start with uh, Ms. Lomas and what's happening at the Hill School next year. Hi, thank you all so much um, for taking the time tonight to hear from Hill School. Um, essentially what we're proposing is, currently our schedule is we start uh, back to school with our kids about four days before the rest of the district starts. Um, our proposal is to add 10 minutes each day and eliminate those first four days. So extend our day rather than 8 a.m. to 3.40, start at 7.50 and go to 3.40 um, and get rid of the first four days. Our reasoning behind this um, is kind of twofold, both for both our families and our staff. Our staff is on the younger side. Um, they have children. They're interested in spending as much time with their kiddos as possible in the summertime. Um, families, we discovered that between 7 and 10% of our kids miss three to four of those beginning of the school year days. And it just makes the beginning of the year very disjointed for setting up classroom routines and procedures, community building, things like that. Um, you get all of your classroom rules done and then four new kids show up and you're like, oh, we gotta do all this all over again. So it just gets really disjointed. Um, when I did the math, um, uh, the state gives us this really handy dandy worksheet um, and eliminated those four days but added 10 minutes to each day. Our hours are actually identical. Uh, we currently go um, 1,379 hours and with this change, we'll also be going 1,379 hours. Um, it also, the additional 10 minutes kind of frees up a lot of space in our schedule to include more intervention blocks in the beginning of the day uh, to be able to give more students the opportunity to receive services um, in smaller group settings uh, and more targeted instruction. Um, so that is what we are hoping to be able to do next year. Any members have any questions? Mr. Sinala. The state has approved your curriculum for the extended day. Are they in accord with the, <coughs> are they flexible enough that you, as long as the time's there, it doesn't have to be in its entirety? Correct. The um, regulations state that we have to go to school for no fewer than 1,365 hours, and we're at 1,379 right now. Dr. Kelly? Sure, just the one other thing that I'd add, and I know Melissa and I have talked about this before, is um, issues that families have had yeah. when one child who's in elementary school is starting a week earlier than other kids who might be in middle school or high school. And um, so I do think that this is a change that will benefit families as well as uh, students and teachers and everybody else. I totally agree. We, we ran a family survey um, mm -hmm. and we asked the question, um, do the, there's the family survey. Uh, uh, uh. The question was shifting school hours will help be helpful to my family and 83% of our families agreed to that. And the second question was eliminating the four additional days at the beginning of the school year will be helpful for my family. And 93% of families responded positively to that. Um, so using that data along with overwhelmingly positive data from our staff, that's where we started the, the shift. So I know, and I know that I'll just add one other thing that I know you have been communicating with families regularly about this, but they'll get a formal oh, yeah. notice um, as the this school year 
ends and we start beginning the process of planning for next school year, Absolutely. which I can't believe is already upon us. <laughs> it so. was like literally a year ago that I was in front of all of you introducing myself. So right. um, it doesn't feel like it's been a year though. Mr. It feels Chairman. like it's been about a minute. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sinella. Does this require action on the school committee part or is this through the superintendent or? Yeah, it's Any other members? No? Just um, if we oh, could Mrs. just um, all support it and just make a motion to support. Move that we support the Second. change. All in favor, all opposed? Aye. Aye. So moved. So our uh, next presentation and the last one for the superintendent's report uh, is from Mr. Pachinski, who's going to share some similar changes um, to the Garfield Middle School's schedule, uh, also within the purview of expanded learning time. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Dr. Kelly, and honored school committee members. I appreciate you taking the time to hear some of the changes that we're proposing for Garfield Middle School next year, as well as some of the rationale uh, behind it. Can move to the next slide. As a brief review, our current schedule, we go from 7.30 to 3.55. We have six 70-minute periods. It's rotating, it cascades on a six-day schedule. And we have 30 minutes, I'm sorry, 35 minutes of split advisory, 10 minutes in the morning and 25 minutes in the afternoon. Now, the rationale for taking a look at this is last period has shown to be much less energetic, rigorous, and engaging than classes earlier in the day and at different times. The cascading schedules help that a little bit. However, it's also made it more evident than when we see a period or a class meet in the afternoon that they're not necessarily as engaged with the material. Um, on top of that, advisory in the afternoon currently is serving much more as a homeroom and a holding pen until the buses show up. Uh, students have finished all their core classes, so now we're trying to develop relationships, which is part of our Gator Code as well as the schools for, I'm sorry, the districts for ours. Um, so we're really not seeing advisories succeed to the level that we want to. So we feel that moving that uh, would assist. Another thing is many students have limited options for enrichment. We really push enrichment at the Garfield, yet we have a contingency of students who are not receiving uh, at least those options in classes because they're either doubled up in ELL classes or that they're being pulled out for academic support such as uh, reading intervention, math strategies. <coughs> After school, offerings are limited due to transportation issues. We have a late bus um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which comes half an hour after school. So if a club and organization wants to run, they're limited to 25 minutes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, or limited to other days when only parents or students who have other options for transportation. So the proposed schedule is six 60-minute classes, rotating as the same schedule that we have, cascading yet with one 58-minute enrichment course, which does not rotate and is located at the end of the day. Afternoon advisory would be moved from 229 to 254. So what this looks like, if we bring up the next slide, is it's the exact same t hours and time period of 730 to 355, except that all core and enrichment classes conclude um, at 229 when students will then move into advisory. And then from advisory, they'll move into enrichment, which would take place at the conclusion of the day. Couple of thoughts on the enrichment options. Uh, uh, the objectives must be tied to the Gator Code of Respect, Responsibility, and Relationships or related to a content area. That they are proposed by teachers with student input and they would be approved by the instructional leadership team. The set time for this at the end of the day and not rotating is optimal for developing outside partnerships and relationships. It's very difficult right now to bring in the, uh, in industry professionals into the building and say, all right, from three to four this week, but next week it's going to be from 7.30 to Eight. It's, so having one set time would really allow us to develop those outside partnerships uh, as well as focus on project-based learning um, as well as um, more enrichment opportunities for all students as well as academic supports. And that is the rationale behind this proposal. Thank you for listening. Any members have any questions? Mr. Paczynski, can you share for just a minute the process that you and your team have gone through in developing this plan uh, in terms of teacher input, student input, and all of that? So this has been developed uh, for a number of years that teachers have visited other schools. Uh, this year, when I kind of took the helm of the Garfield, we took a look at 
what has been working and what hasn't been working. Uh, the instructional leadership team really brought up the idea that they would like to propose a new schedule and look into that. From there, a team was developed, including union representatives, uh, administrators, teachers, ILT members, to explore and to develop this team. Um, we reached out to teachers to solicit input and questions. We did that electronically through Google Forms. On top of that, during uh, principal meetings, um, teachers who'd been involved on the team presented out to staff to keep them informed of the process. Two weeks ago, a team put together by Mr. Fearing <coughs> met with Dr. Kelly and Dr. McCabe and myself um, and presented that. And so the next step of this process is to have the staff vote on either maintaining the current schedule or moving on to this proposal. So I just wanted to point out it's been an extensive, mm -hmm. thoughtful process of not something that just was put together quickly. So, I appreciate that. Any other members? So has Ms. The, staff voted on it yet? the staff has not voted on it yet, no. Well, I, again, we wanted to share information uh, with all of you and also use this venue to share information with um, parents and students to start getting it out to them so that when uh, Mr. Pachinski sends his notification home to them, we anticipate that the staff is going to be very supportive. The staff were very much involved in the, design, the redesign of the schedule, so we don't anticipate that there'll be any problems with that. Um, and what we want to do is start that communication process so people have multiple opportunities to hear about um, these impending changes. And that's why we had uh, both Ms. Lomas and um, Mr. Pritchinski present tonight. It does not require any action on our part. It does not. Again, as last, as you did with the Hill School, we certainly would like your endorsement, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sinella. Well, mentioning the staff, uh, if, if it's a policy made by yourself and school committee, what objections? It's not changing. They're still in the same amount of time. How would it affect them that they possibly would object to it? So the main objection that I would anticipate or see is like staff currently teach four classes. Sorry. So the main objection that I would see is staff currently teach four 70-minute classes. That would change to four 60-minute classes plus one 58-minute uh, enrichment course. Now, when we do the numbers out as far as time for students, that is the, the exact uh, same minutes, 457 minutes in front of teachers for students this uh, next year would be 458. <coughs> so technically, technically they'd be required to teach an extra period is? It, the time is the time, the time, the time, time, the time is right, relatively the same, but also that period would be, would be something that ideally the staff are proposing that they want to teach. It's something that they're excited to do. It's located at the end of the day. Um, ideally, it would be best for students as we hope to see uh, greater engagement at the end of the day, uh, as well as impact with attendance in MCIA data, uh, vocal data, and other trends. Well, I mean, if it's the same time and everything else, it's, there's no change. It, it's, again, it's just where some of the minutes moved and yeah, okay. having that schedule not cascade at the end of the day so we have a set time. Like I can remember with the old Garfield, we were in double sessions. When we were on the afternoon, about 4 o'clock, everyone wanted to take a nap. So, so it's, and we were there till 5.15, so. Right, and was, you know, it's, it's difficult for staff and yeah. students. I think this is yeah. one way to, you know, re-energize and get people engaged. And staff uh, does seem to be excited. I think part of this is reflected in the ELT vote that was taken, uh, I believe, in February, yes. where I believe it was 11 to 33, which is a higher number than we've experienced in the past number of years. Well, I, I think it's, it's to be credited to your administration that you're taking the time to analyze, tweak it, to make it more productive. Thank so, you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sonella. Ms. Ty. Uh, one question. So the teachers will propose what enrichment class they would like to teach? Yes. And will there be grades given in this there, there, will, be, there will be grades given. So there will be evaluated. So that will be graded. So they will be evaluated so that they, they that will go. Yes. Will the students be graded? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> students will be graded and evaluated. Okay. No, I'm just asking so, out of curiosity. Right. So what we've done is we set up a Google Doc for starters that, you know, again, the guidance that we've given is that we'd like to see it tied into either some type of core standard or to the Gator Code itself of respect, responsibility, and relationships. So that opens the door a little bit for staff to think outside the box. And uh, some of the proposals um, 
are outside of the box. Others are a little bit more traditional as far as a creative writing course. Um, so again, we are also soliciting student, or the plan is to get student feedback as far as what they would like to learn and what they would like to see, and then we can also provide that to the staff, that if you know a student really wants to take um, a foreign language, <laughs> which we don't offer right now, that we might have a staff member who would be comfortable teaching French or teaching a culture class. Um, so however, for the final acceptance, it will be looked at by the instructional leadership team. So similar to the RFPs that are proposed now, if a staff wants to offer an enrichment class, it'd be a similar process. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I move that the school committee show support. Second. Motion, second. Motion and a second. All in favor, all opposed? Aye. So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Paczynski. We are on to our student representative report. Waleed, take it away. Thank you. Um, to begin, I just wanted to start off by saying that um, tomorrow there's going to be the um, Revere, School, Revere Schools Art Show, which will be held at the SBA Middle School from uh, at 5 p.m. Just I, we urge people to show up and so, show support for these creative um, Revere student artists. And on Thursday, May 2nd, uh, Revere, uh, Revere High will be hosting the annual Student Showcase and Multicultural Night. Uh, from 4.30 to 7 p.m. in the RHS Cafeteria and Fieldhouse. Students will um, present interesting topics and assignments and, and the such that they've been working out throughout the years or throughout the year. And many of the extracurricular clubs uh, will show their accomplishments and their goals for the upcoming years. Um, additionally, the RHS Sophomore Student Council and the RHS Student Senate will be visiting the Massachusetts State House on May 1st for the annual Day on the Hill uh, held by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. And finally, um, good luck to all the students taking the AP exams in the second two weeks of May. Thank you. Oh. Any, you any members? You should say that. What, Ms. Ty? Tell us what, what three you're taking. Uh, AP Calculus BC, uh, AP Psychology, and AP Spanish. Wow. Thank you. Any other members? We'll move on to public participation. Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Ms. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to make a motion to take the communication regarding the Revere High School student activity account off of the consent calendar and to the floor. Second. Okay. Okay. Any members? Um, no, we have to separate calendar. We're, we're gonna no, that's separate. We're on the consent calendar. Okay, so roll call on the calendar without communications. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moranti? Yes. Ms. Gravelisi? Yes. Mr. Buizzo? Yes. Mr. Snell? Yes. Ms. Thai? Yes. Mr. Visconti? Yes. Mayor Rigo? Yes. Now we will move on to the uh, increase of local high school activity okay. account limit. Mr. Visconti. This is a request by the school business um, office um, requesting that the school committee vote to increase the on deposit limit of the Revere High School student activity checking account from 50000 to 75000 um, Would like to say that this is mainly um, due to the fact that um, the mayor has been granted or uh, granted 200,000 in new monies to uh, the student activities uh, account in $5,000 allotment. So I would like to say thank you to the mayor for doing such. And um, I believe it um, needs a, a vote. Any other members? Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Kelly. Uh, so I, I would just like to echo uh, Mr. Visconti and thank you very much uh, for, for what you've done for the clubs and activities at the schools. It's the first time our clubs and activities, in my knowledge, have seen such an influx and an opportunity to really um, get new equipment or new uniforms or new supplies, materials, um, in some cases go on field trips or travel and visit sites related to their club or activity that they normally wouldn't be able to go to. Uh, the the kids and the adults are absolutely ecstatic about it and 
uh, we thank you very, very much for that generosity. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, you're very welcome. I think it's um, the least that we can do for our students. Um, I will say this, that although it was my idea, and I'll take credit for it, um, it did require also approval from the city council. So the city council does have um, a hand in, in supporting this, um, this uh, appropriation of money. And I do think that uh, it's very well deserved uh, and that our students will do amazing things with it. And I look forward to hearing and seeing all of those amazing things. And I know all of you uh, do as well. So thank you. Uh, but it does take a village and it includes the city council. And I want to thank them for their support. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so roll, do we need a roll call? Roll call. Mrs. Morant? Yes. Ms. Rabelizzi? Yes. Mrs. Rizzo? Yes. Mr. Sonella? Yes. Ms. Stein? Yes. Mr. Visconti? Yes. Mayor Arrigo? Yes. Motion passes. We will move on to the report of subcommittees. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Mm -hmm. Ms. Tai. Um, for the personnel subcommittee, we are now engaged in negotiations with AFSME for the bus monitors and part-time cafeteria workers serving on that committee. Uh, Mrs. Gravelisi, you, Mr. Bear, and I, we are all, uh, we're part of it, and we're just in the beginning stages, but we hope, of course, that we will be able to have a satisfactory um, and just contract that will be ready shortly. Um, we're, we're very optimistic. Secondly, we've had other uh, reports about evaluations and so forth, and uh, but since that's all private, we can't share them with the public. We just know that we are continuing to do evaluations and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tai. Mrs. Rizzo? Yes, as the representative from Revere Schools um, to the Shore Collaborative um, in Chelsea, just wanted to give you a quarterly report. Um, we are up to 39 students being serviced. We are also expanding that they do a rental at 201 Crescent Ave. The adult services will be going over there so that the Owen School on the Parkway will be strictly for um, the student services. So hopefully we'll have more seats there if needed. Um, also want to say that um, we've done evaluations for the executive director, Jackie Clark, also the assistant di um, director, Bob Alcanada, and treasurer Joe Sacco um, that were very favorable and also ended to extend the contract to Bob Alcanada. Canada, and I apologize for missaying his name. Um, and we are still working and discussing the professional units collective bargaining agreement. And unfortunately, it's been two years with other contracts, so hopefully the next two months will solve a, a lot. And on a personal note, I'm the only one that had perfect attendance for the year, but thank you. We should I give, get a certificate. We should give certificate. Mrs. Rizzo a certificate. Perfect to attendance Perfect attendance certificate, I think, is in order. Yes, definitely. We'll find out. We'll make sure it's the right venue. Yeah. Uh, any, any other, any other uh, subcommittee reports? Okay, seeing none, we'll go on to old business. Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the one item under old business for the committee is the school year calendar for the 1920 school year, uh, which I shared a draft of with you in February. Uh, we were anticipating some possible changes after that, which did not come to fruition. So uh, the calendar that we are proposing is the same calendar that we proposed in February. And just to highlight a couple of things for families at home, um, we would be looking to start uh, the school year uh, with our traditional one half day for teachers and then students would come back on uh, August 27th, which is the Tuesday before the Labor Day weekend, um, which is what we're accustomed to. What we're not incorporating in our very beginning of the year activities is the full day professional development that we normally have with teachers. 
That instead will occur in November on election day so that there will be no school for no children in schools uh, on election day uh, this coming year. Um, which will allow the citizens of Riviera to exercise their, uh, their right to vote. And uh, teachers will be engaged in professional development at that time that we're excited to be conducting for the first time in collaboration with the other districts of the five district partnership. So Chelsea, Winthrop, Everett, Riviera, and Malden will, all of those teachers will be able to collaborate with each other on that day. Uh, the one district that possibly won't be with us is Everett uh, due to some changes that they have undergo that they're undergoing in, in there right now. So um, with this projected, anticipating the same mild winter that we had this year, the last day of school would be June 16th. Uh, of course, if we do end up having any uh, snow days, that date would be pushed out accordingly. Um, and of course, we do need the committee's vote on this calendar. Any members? Any members on the uh, school year calendar for 2019-2020? Uh, is there a motion to approve the calendar? A motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Roll call. Mr. Yes. Mrs. Brizzo? Yes. Mrs. Nella? Yes. Mr. Tai? Yes. Mr. Visconti? Yes. Mayor Carrido? Yes. Uh, we're on to new business. Any, any members have any new business? None. School committee interests. Anyone? No. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mrs. Rizzo. I'm here. As um, Waleed already um, spoke about, um, the school committee's day on the hill is Wednesday, May 1st. Um, we start at the Masonic Temple and then we go to the State House. Um, lucky that um, we have Waleed and probably about 25. He keeps saying the number's going up, but the more the merrier. Um, I know. Um, Everyone was impressed with the Revere students last year, so I'm so glad they're coming back this year. Um, some of the questions um, that we'll be bringing up to the legislators is support of early education um, to improve affordability of the programs, funding to support district transition to universal free tuition. Um, another subject would be strengthening the children's service safety net um, and of course, fund and revision on Chapter 70A to reflect the 21st century needs um, so that we would increase funding so each district reaches its appropriate level, ensure the inflation factor in the formula so that it's realistic and accurate, and ensuring um, that districts receive $100 per pupil increase in Chapter 70 for 2020 to help improve the underfunded formula. And one of the other big items that we'll be um, expressing is full funding for the special ed circuit breaker. So um, Waleed will be um, doing some homework with the students. They will be making their mark at us, um, Capitol Hill. And I look forward to seeing them and any other school com committee member that wants to join us. Um, we usually have almost 500 people there, so it'll be nice. And hopefully it doesn't rain, because it does usually rain, but thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rizzo. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sinella. Uh, through you to the superintendent, the students that are going in, are, are they gonna be provided transportation? Whoops. Sorry, I caught my knee there. Yes, they will be provided transportation. Thank you. Are you taking the tea? Yeah, yeah so last year we actually, we've done it for model un it's it's something that students are fairly like known of we lived and grew up and grew up in boston it's just part of the we meet up at beachmont um and then we just take the tea together as a group so that's what uh get off state and then 
the uh, temple. Yeah. Yeah. And then they walk to the state house. Exactly. Yeah. Any other members? Ms. Chai? I, I'd just like to give a shout out to all the parents who are here tonight. You know, when I when we did the um, uh, the spelling bees, you know, those kids would not have been so successful. And by the way, we went farther this year in the spelling bees in all the schools than we have ever gone in any previous year. Right. So we had a group of stars. And it's, you, they don't get that way without having a lot of parental support because the parents have to keep drilling them on the words and asking them, uh, making sure that they keep up. And it's interesting that the kids who won the, my, the myopoly were the same kids who had won Colella Awards as being the number one in their classes when they were in elementary school or middle school. They were the same ones who won spelling bees and and that doesn't happen with a, without a lot of family support. So I'd like to give a shout out to all the parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever it is that help these kids to succeed. And we are the beneficiary of what they have done. So thanks to the kids and thanks to the parents. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Tai. Any other, any other members have uh, school committee interests? Ms. Gravelisi. Thank you, Mayor Arrigo. Um, I just wanted to make mention that before um, April vacation that um, myself and some other school committee members and Dr. Kelly and Dr. Perella did tour the high school as it was stated um, that we had planned on doing prior to um, them going on school vacation. We did tour, we um, engaged with students along the way. Um, we were, you know, pleasantly surprised and pleased with the behaviors that we met during the tour. Um, we do plan on having more walkthrough tours throughout the year and discuss some of the, um, you know, discussions that we had prior to about behaviors and, you know, hopefully everybody will be satisfied at the end of our discussions regarding this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gravelisi. Any other members? None. Um, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. All right, and we will adjourn until May 21st. All right. Good evening. <laughs>